Yeah. Did you, as a child, have such a sign on your bedroom door? Or perhaps your children do, or perhaps you still have it. <laughs> well, the warning should be clear. Three can keep a secret only when two are dead. <laughs> And later in life, such threats make us smile. But they are an important milestone in our development. Sorry, some of you missed it. <laughs> As a small child, we assume that everyone knows everything of us. But when we are four years old, we realize that our parents are far from omniscient. And that's the moment when we separate from others and we start to develop our own identity. And suddenly, we wake up to the fact that cleverly applied knowledge is power. And some power is better kept as secret. On the average, every one of us here has 13 secrets. And five of them you will keep your entire life. Those are secrets born of your strongest emotions, sexual preferences you may be ashamed of, or fears, grief, as well as dreams of another personality or another life. That's mine. All your secrets, your private thoughts and memories make you who you are. Your individuality, your personality, but also your vulnerability. Which is why you protect it with the strongest, impenetrable firewall there is. And that's your brain. No one can read it. And true freedom, true security only exists in the mind. There is no other place. And that's why it's our source of strength. It's sacrosanct. And frankly, we never bothered to question it, this refuge and this retreat. But what if that should change? Imagine there is someone who can read your thoughts, even the one you don't perceive. And that might sound like science fiction, but it's more real than you think. Take your decisions. Your decisions are predictable before you consciously make them. This device combined with machine learning can do that. Which decisions are predictable is still limited, but yet it is possible to read your unconscious thought processes and then use this information to anticipate, for example, your buying behavior. And this has long been common practice in neuromarketing research. So your brain areas provide a wealth of material uh, to read, such as your political leaning, if you are a Republican or you are a Democrat. But there is little risk of manipulation since you rarely go shopping or to vote while in the CT machine. Or did any one of you vote like that? I hope not. <laughs> All the same. Never underestimate your brain's technological pathways. Imagine you have had a serious accident. You can still think and hear and feel, but you can no more move and communicate. You are in a vigilant coma, and your family doesn't know if you can hear them. And still your family has to decide life support or not. This brain-computer interface can help you. It can save you. It not only measures your consciousness level, but can read your answers to yes or no questions as you think them. I tried it myself, and it is impressively precise. I could even control letters on my keyboard. I felt like superwoman. And afterwards, I asked myself, hmm, What if this device, or one like it, is abused? If it is used as a lie detector, as they already do in North America, and as it has been already tested at the Hungarian border by the EU Commission, what almost nobody knows, then what will become of our right of silence? Also, Silicon Valley has been striving to decode the human brain since quite some time. Enormous sums are invested in neurotechnology, and patents have increased 500% over the last few years. 
So if Facebook, Google, Amazon, or Apple, however, could convince a mere 1% of their billions user to have their brain data measured while surfing, imagine that would be the greatest neuro research study of all time and research dimensions that science can only dream of. On the other hand, <laughs> there is the question, who wants to spend their time in a wired, gooey, unsexy bathing cap? And you might think, um, what idiot gives her consent to take such a photo with? I don't know her. <laughs> but anyway, there are more elegant options. This BCI is a product of a US-American startup and is commercially marketed. It measures concentration levels and offers practical support to people with compulsive or at attentiveness disorders, such as ADHD. That's fantastic. And an elementary school in China, they were so delighted, they immediately hooked up all school kids. No more daydreaming. Either you are concentrating or you blink. I, I would like to have it now for you. <laughs> the same data grants access to decoding other information. Fears, grief, excitement, depression, your state of mind. So in these cases, how can we speak of voluntary action? Explicit or implicit, it's an act of coercion. So I've asked myself, when is it not? And yes, there are those who privately and willingly use BCI, namely gamers. Esport and neurogaming is a growing market. And what users don't know and certainly don't want is that neurogaming not only allows access to your performance, but also to direct questions concerning information stored in your brain. PIN number, banking data, location, identity. Completely without your knowledge, simply while playing a game, proven by a scientific experiment. And hackers can slip through security gaps accessing this data. And once identified, there is a 94% probability that your neuro data can be traced to you. Why? Because neuro data is unique. But even if you are no gamer, there are still other approaches to read your thought processes. For example, a nice little detour over your muscles by means of sensors and artificial intelligence. It makes silent speech possible and no more need of typing. Good for me, only with two fingers. <laughs> but, by the way, one such research study was financed by Facebook. Facebook has a team of 60 engineers working on brain-computer interfaces. And a few weeks ago, Facebook acquired a brain-computing startup for nearly $1 billion. So Facebook wants to be among the winners of the next big device. It's just a matter of time. But yet, all of the aforementioned examples have two practical disadvantages. First, the device is visible. And second, we would have much more accurate data and precise control if we penetrated the skull. So, why not? Let's do it. A deep brain stimulation implants an electrode directly in the brain. It can predict epileptic seizures. It can heal depression. And it can reactivate the memory of dementia patients. What a great achievement. But patients have reported post-operative reactions that they are completely out of character, yeah? that they felt strange, and they have told that they have factually lost their sense of self. Imagine what a weapon. And I don't know if the US military thought the same, but it has been studying neurotechnology for many years now, aiming to enhance their soldiers' uh, uh, learning and uh, cognitive ab abilities. 
So it would enable them to manipulate memory, but also the capacity for empathy. However, the operation is risky, and the operation is very expensive. So research team DARPA, funded by the US military, came up with another innovative solution. It's a minimally invasive procedure. You hardly feel it. There's little or no risk. An implanted device that makes its own way to the brain, traveling through a vein, a mere four millimeter, it's smaller than a paperclip, and controls, for example, the brain sector governing movement, and has the potential to animate paralysis patients. Also, it records every movement, and future models hope to be externally controlled. I hope they never fall into the wrong hand. But let there be no mistake. Technology itself, it's not frightening. Huh? Its applications are. Every advancement has a dual-use aspect. And new technology might be one of the greatest uh, human innovations, but so are the risks, especially when manipulated by forensic, commercial or military intentions. And right now, we are not able to read all your individual thoughts. So far, the positive healing applications outweigh the negative ones. But there is cause for concern, since sufficient legal protection is not yet in place. And we've made such a mistake before. Think of social media. Think of Alexa or your mobile. And we have grown accustomed to all these data hoovers and can hardly turn back time. We accept the laws of privacy, but we should not repeat this mistake again. At this point, though, we still have a chance to install prudent regulations, protecting neurodata before the technology spreads to mass consumption, which is bound to happen. Why? Because Nero data opens the floodgates to another life, full of convenience, our dream, and therefore unprecedented business models. So, how are we currently protected? In Europe, there is the precautionary principle. That means, until the long-term technological effects are not clearly defined, we are to uh, proceed with extreme caution. But in all likelihood, companies will choose locations where these principles do not apply. For example, USA, where a disruptive approach is a given and technology primarily serves economic growth. And where military co-funding is a common practice. So let's have a look what kind of data neurodata is. Obviously, neurodata seems to be sensitive data. And in Europe, the list of laws governing sensitive data is highly exclusive. Neurodata is not on it. According to current laws, neurodata is as worthy of protection as that. Measuring your food size which is why we need a new approach and a global approach. Even the currently existing human rights are not sufficient. They emerge from a time prior to our technological age, and they assume that no one can penetrate your mind. But technological pro progress is outrising time, and therefore we urgently need adequate rights. And neuroscientists demand this as well. So we need rights that empower you to protect yourself of coercion, of manipulation, to empower your mental privacy, and to empower you to decide whether and which neuro data you share, because brain-computer interfaces will become part of our daily life. And if there's one thing that's threatened with extinction, it is our secrets. But you know, some human attributes, they will never change. You and I, we need our secrets, not only because they conceal our uh, vulnerability or our brilliant ideas and also the stupid ones, but because without 
there would, no, there would be no uh, interiority, no subjectivity. It's about your thoroughly unique dimension of consciousness, a dimension not found in the rest of the world, in reality. So interiority is probably the most valuable asset humanity has. And that's why, once more, <laughs> let us remember the instinct and wisdom of a child. And this time I'm asking you, who will you let in? Who gets access to your interiority? And now my call upon you is, get up, stand up, please. You've done the first step. Thank you. <laughs>